For all its beauty and splendor, the wilderness can be a cruel teacher. Climbing a mountain with friends is an adventure that blends the joys of camaraderie with the challenges of nature. It's a journey where bonds are forged and tested amidst breathtaking landscapes and unforeseen obstacles. Climbing a mountain is not for the faint of heart. It's a harsh and unforgiving endeavor, a raw test of your strength, willpower, and resilience. It's a relentless struggle against the elements, your own limitations, and the unyielding mountain itself. It is the mountain, not the mountaineer, that decides if it's your day of reckoning. Please click the subscribe and like buttons. This is Outdoor Disasters. Nestled in the western part of the state of Washington lies one of the most iconic mountains in North America, Mount Rainier. Mount Rainier is a masterpiece of nature. Its majesty looms on the horizon, a breathtaking sight with its massive, prominent snow-clad peaks and glaciers that glisten in the sun. The park's extensive trail network invites hikers of all levels to venture into its depths. From gentle strolls through ancient forests to challenging ascents up rocky slopes, every path offers a chance to connect with the land and breathe in pure mountain air. At 14,410 feet or 4,392 meters, above sea level, Mount Rainier is the highest peak in the Cascade Range. The mountain is an active volcano, though it has been dormant since its last eruption in the mid-19th century. The park's pristine landscapes include lush rainforests, glacial valleys, and pristine alpine environments. Mount Rainier is adorned with numerous glaciers, contributing to its remarkable appearance. Emmons Glacier is the largest glacier in the lower 48, and is located on the mountain's northeastern slope. Mount Rainier is a popular destination for mountaineers and climbers. Climbers from around the world attempt to summit the peak each year. The ascent is challenging and requires technical climbing skills. Mount Rainier National Park is not only a sanctuary for nature enthusiasts, but also a place to immerse yourself in the breathtaking landscapes of the Pacific Northwest. Its stunning vistas, diverse ecosystems, and outdoor recreational opportunities make it a must-visit destination for those seeking an authentic wilderness experience. For one group of climbers, their Mount Rainier climb would be treacherous. On June 19, 2012, five climbers from Waco, Texas, set out to summit Mount Rainier. The climbing party used Rainier as a warm-up for a much harder climb of Denali, the tallest mountain in North America. The group included Stacy Liedel, then a senior at Baylor University. Stuart Smith, an attorney from Waco with a climbing resume that includes some of the world's tallest peaks, including Mount Everest. His niece, Noelle Smith, Ross Van Dyke, Baylor's assistant director of admission counseling. He had made a previous attempt on Mount Rainier that was called off due to weather. And lastly, Claire McDonald. They decided to do the Emmons Glacier route, a climbing route with no indicators on the trail. On the first night of the two-day climb, they hiked past Camp Sherman and camped on the glacier above it at a place called Sherman Flats. The next morning, the group was up by 1.30 a.m. and began climbing by 2.30. The way up was icy and at an incline of 40 to 50 degrees. I remember sitting in camp the day before our summit push and you can see the summit and just trying to visualize standing on top of the mountain, visualizing the goal. Everything was going really well. It was completely clear. Our team was meshing really well at this point due to illness and just some different stuff going on. There were four of us who were going to make the summit push, she said. Claire McDonald wasn't feeling well and was forced to turn back. Van Dyke and Stuart Smith climbed down with her. And when they returned, the group continued towards the summit. The climb progressed smoothly and Lidl and her companions exhibited excellent teamwork. Eventually, they successfully reached the summit where they celebrated with Snickers bars and captured the moment with photos. Their enthusiasm centered on returning to camp for a warm bowl of soup and commemorating their achievement. However, they were unaware of an approaching weather front, which had been forecasted for arrival at Mount Rainier either later that night or the following day, but unexpectedly arrived 12 hours ahead of schedule. As they descended from the summit, the temperature took a sharp nosedive. The snow that had been soft and ideal for climbing on the way up had now turned hard and icy due to recent rainfall at higher elevations. During their ascent, the team had successfully crossed a Bergschrund, a sizable crevasse with a narrow snow bridge. However, the shifting weather conditions forced them to seek an alternative route to navigate the Bergschrund. 
The rapid freezing of everything around them resulted in an abrupt shift to a significantly steeper section of the glacier with an approximately 50 degrees incline and a daunting drop of 3,000 feet or around 900 meters below them. So we had just summited. We were about 1,000 feet below the summit. We were doing a traverse and they don't let you flag on the Emmons Glacier. So we were trying to navigate around a Bergschrund and I was leading the group. As we were going along, it looked as if there was, I don't know, 100 yards left and then we would have been safe, he said. They had pickets and placed every X number of feet along the route, ensuring safety in case of a fall during their climb. They knew it was a dangerous part of the climb, so taking precautions was essential. Stuart Smith, the person leading the group, completed the traverse. They reached a safer section of the glacier while the rest of the team followed. However, they had run out of pickets with all of them placed in the front and none left for the back. Despite this, the group collectively decided not to put another picket and instead relied on careful movement and retrieval of their gear. In reality, I felt really scared because I wasn't on the safe part of the glacier. It was still pretty steep, but you never want to be the weakest link, especially when you're the youngest one, especially being female. You never want to be the one who says, I'm scared or I feel slow or I don't feel capable of this. But I didn't say anything. I just said, yep, that sounds good. Let's pull the picket, Lidl said. Meanwhile, the fifth member of the team, Claire McDonald, was observing their descent from the base camp through binoculars. I got hurt a couple months before the trip and I wasn't able to train like I wanted to. I woke up that morning and was hopeful, but I also didn't sleep very well that night. My stomach was really upset, so I hiked down to the little ranger station there and they had some super high power binoculars they were letting me play with, she said. It is here, through the binoculars, she would witness the upcoming disaster. Stacy, Stuart, Ross, and Noel retrieved the final piece of equipment and commenced their descent. After taking a couple of steps, Stacy attempted to plant her right crampon on the surface, but discovered that it provided insufficient traction. Despite trying to self-arrest with her ice axe, the unyielding icy snow made it impossible to prevent the slide. She instantly realized she had no control over their downward movement. I remember jumping out in a self-arrest pose. I mean, I barely got my ax in before we were ripped from the slope. I felt like I was pulled off of the mountain. When we fell, I thought immediately about my wife and I said, hey, this is it. This is how I'm gonna die, Ross said. Unbeknownst to them, the Bergschrund they had been trying to traverse was just beneath them, concealed from view. As they tumbled through the air, they realized this was the end, how they would meet their demise. The impact was brutal as Stacy collided with the other side of the crevasse, and everything went dark as her head snapped back. I think I knew right away exactly what was happening and how bad it was because they fell very quickly. When they stopped falling, that was surprising. I didn't understand how they stopped falling, Claire said. Twenty minutes later, Stacy slowly regained consciousness and found herself lying on her back in the snow, gradually reacquainting herself with her surroundings. She was relieved to discover that she was still alive, secured by her harness. Beside her lay Stuart Smith with their bodies entangled in the rope. Peering downward, she spotted one of their companions hanging approximately 60 feet or 18 meters below, also connected by the rope. Nevertheless, the whereabouts of the third team member remained uncertain. Stacy noticed that two ends of the rope led uphill, and without hesitation, she began ascending although she no longer had an ice axe at her disposal. With unwavering determination to avoid another fall, she clawed her way up the slope, using her fingernails to dig into the icy surface. Upon reaching the brink of a narrow crevasse, she saw Noelle Smith, who was dangling inside the crevasse. Noelle had slipped into the crevasse during the fall, but not completely, effectively halting the group's fall and ultimately saving their lives. However, Noelle was in a state of distress uttering incoherent cries, and her harness was gradually slipping down her leg, putting everyone at risk of plummeting into the seemingly bottomless chasm. Stacy knew Noel was the anchor for the rope and the lifeline for the entire team. A sense of urgency came over her. The other climbers were in an extremely vulnerable state with limited responsiveness. Stacy was confronted with the immediate and daunting task of formulating a plan for their escape from this disaster. Meanwhile, Peter Ramos, a climber with a different party, had just summited Mount Rainier. So I had just summited Liberty Ridge on Mount Rainier with a friend of mine and we were exhausted and ready for a break. 
but I looked over toward the Emmons Glacier and I saw some bodies lying down on their back with a knee up. I thought, oh, that's an interesting way to rest. I kept looking over toward this group and once we moved toward them, we realized it was no longer a rest, he said. Claire McDonald, horrified, looking on from her binoculars down at the ranger station, stated, I said something pretty quickly to the two rangers I was with and gave them the binoculars and they weren't sure, but I just kept telling him, no, they fell, they fell, they fell. They wanted to wait for a while and see if they moved, and nobody moved for a while. That's when they started making radio calls and doing the amazing things they did that day. Upon regaining consciousness, Ross Van Dyke found himself disoriented, struggling to make sense of his surroundings. He detected distant voices, but his senses were akin to those in a movie scene after an explosion. Initial silence followed by a ringing sensation, gradually giving way to clarity. Where am I? He pondered. Surveying his surroundings, he saw no one in his vicinity. But then he heard a familiar voice calling his name. Gazing upward, he spotted Stacy. You have to come up here. I can't explain, but you have to come to me, she yelled. Van Dyke drags himself up this mountain with a dislocated pelvis. I didn't know exactly at the time what had happened. I thought that I had broken my femur. There was so much adrenaline going on at that point, I didn't feel any pain. I proceeded to use my one good leg and the crampon that was on that leg and my ice axe in the opposite hand to climb up what may have been 75, maybe 100 feet to where Stacy was. I passed Stuart. I thought he was dead, he said. On the other end, calls from the ranger station were David Bulger, a U.S. Army Reserve Chinook helicopter pilot. When I first got the call, I wasn't aware of how dire the situation was with the climbers or how bad the weather was becoming. By the time I got to the unit and started doing the planning and got the weather, I realized it was going to be the very challenging scenario. Of course I was nervous, David said. For the mission to rescue the climbers on Mount Rainier, the crew comprised two pilots in the front seats, accompanied by a flight engineer responsible for external assessments. Furthermore, there was a crew chief overseeing the winch operation and members from the National Park Service who were integral to the mission. These National Park Service personnel had been picked up at the base of Mount Rainier to aid in the rescue operation. In addition, Madigan Army Hospital sent two paramedics to reinforce their team. Before takeoff, the entire team ensured that they conducted a comprehensive briefing. The two pilots discussed and planned each operation phase, considering various potential scenarios. They felt well prepared for the impending task, save for one lingering uncertainty, the precise condition of the climbers they were soon to rescue. The gravity of the situation remained unknown until they reached the rescue site. Meanwhile, Peter Ramos arrived at the location of the fall, a journey that took him and his climbing partner 45 minutes. As a seasoned mountain guide and an expedition nurse, Ramos swiftly sprang into action. Ross, on the other hand, was stunned at what had just happened, with his thoughts echoing, holy shit. At the scene, Ramos and his team encountered a total of four individuals. Noel was trapped within a crevasse, while two others were positioned on a snow bridge just above Noel in the crevasse. Further down the slope, Stuart Smith was lying on his back approximately 25 feet away. I asked for people to raise a hand if they can hear me. Three of them raised their hand except for the person in the crevasse. They actually ended up sustaining a big head injury and they weren't following directions very well. She couldn't state her name. She couldn't state where she was. When I asked if people remember falling off the mountain, she did not. At that moment, I knew that the person in the crevasse was more critical and we had to get her out, Peter said. Until now, Noel served as the anchor, keeping them alive. It's a miracle that she fell into the crevasse, Lidl said. Then Peter managed to set up an anchor. And around that time, climbing rangers from the base camp where Claire McDonald was watching from had ascended to their location. The physical effort that those two rangers put in getting up there. I don't know how they did what they did. It doesn't. The math doesn't make sense how quickly they were able to get from where I was to where our team was. It was just mind-blowing, Claire said. The rangers went to work deciphering the situation and how to commence with the rescue. They set an anchor. They were able to pull my partners out of the crevasse. They were able to stabilize our whole situation, Stacy said. Once the rangers arrived, Peter turned to them and stated, This is your rescue, and this is your mountain. You tell me where you need me. 
they requested him to provide medical assistance. Peter proceeded to check on each individual and evaluate their injuries. One of the climbers seated nearby had a broken leg, a broken arm, and a broken back. The person Peter was attending to at that moment had a collapsed lung and two broken legs. The other climber had a dislocated hip and a brain bleed, and he believed she had also suffered a broken back. Upon their arrival at the scene, David Bulger and his team observed the climbers sprawled along the glacier, all in the prone position, clearly showing signs of injuries. The rescuers had triaged the individuals on the ground, establishing the order in which they would be evacuated. The most severely injured were the first priority. During the initial hoist, they lowered it to the rescue personnel and smoothly raised Noel Smith without encountering any problems. After Ramos successfully placed the climber into the sled, the Chinook helicopter hoisted her up and momentarily flew away to transport her to safety. Meanwhile, they prepared to assist the next critically injured individual on the slopes, Stuart Smith. The winds at this juncture were strong and a storm had rolled in. Stuart began saying that he felt warm. When someone suffering from hypothermia claims to be warm, it indicates a severe stage of hypothermia and immediate action is required although it may be late for recovery at that point. The wind was getting worse, and we knew that this snow system was getting closer, faster than we initially anticipated. So we knew we were coming under a tight window, but we knew we were just gonna continue this operation and get as many people off the mountain as we could, Bulger said. Stacy's most vivid recollection was the intense wind and the powerful rotor wash that felt like it was scorching her skin due to the ice being propelled by it. The helicopter wasn't the usual type, but a Chinook, boasting two rotors, and witnessing it hover above, was an absolutely astonishing sight. I don't know if you guys have ever been around or under a Chinook, but it's a spaceship. It's just unbelievably huge, Ross Van Dyke said. On that day, the crew comprised three pilots, with two in the cockpit, and an extra pilot tasked with monitoring the cliff base. The team also included a crew chief responsible for operating the winch and a flight engineer. In addition to the Corps crew, David's team picked up two paramedics from a nearby Army hospital and two more National Parks rescue climbers. These rescue climbers were highly regarded within the National Park Service as elite members. They had undergone extensive training in various fields, including alpine mountaineering, aviation, technical rope rescue, avalanche forecasting, backcountry skiing, and emergency medical services. Among these accomplished climbers was Nick Hall. The flight engineer called the hoist distance off the ground and informed the crew that contact was made with the ground, and the rescue climber had unhooked the cable. As the sled was coming down, Peter saw Nick Hall reaching for the sled and giving the okay that the cable was clear to bring in the cable. And the next thing I hear is, oh God, he fell, Bulger said. Peter was anchored into the hillside when he sensed an impact that slightly nudged him down the slope. He briefly depended on his anchor to prevent himself from sliding down the steep, icy terrain. Looking over his shoulder, he witnessed what appeared to be a person hurtling down the slope at high speed. Realizing the gravity of the situation, Peter quickly averted his gaze and couldn't bring himself to watch the remainder of the incident. I quickly looked away as I realized what had just happened, and I couldn't quite watch the rest of it, he said. Stacy Liedel recalls, it was just chaos all at once. Everyone's yelling into their radios. You hear lots of things going on. And then it was just silence. At the time, I didn't know what had happened and I definitely didn't realize the gravity of it, but I remember sensing that something had not gone according to plan. I remember hearing a voice come over to the radio and say, can someone go down there and check if he's still with us? Bulger nosed the helicopter forward, closely tracking the hall's descent down the mountain. He descended to approximately 8,000 feet then executed a turn to reverse the helicopter's course, initiating a zigzag pattern as he ascended the gully in search of the climber. Spotting Hall at the base of a cliff, he positioned the helicopter directly above, hovering briefly about a hundred feet above, diligently watching for any signs of movement or response. Recognizing he needed to drop someone down, Bulger had trouble finding a suitable drop-off point in the rugged terrain. He backtracked down the gully by approximately a quarter mile, maintaining the hover. A rescue climber leaped from the helicopter and commenced their journey back to Nick's location. However, fuel levels were running dangerously low at this point. The helicopter returned to its helipad, and shortly after, 
the coordinator relayed the news that the climber who had been dropped off informed him that Nick Hall had passed away at the scene. That was a pretty surreal moment to realize that, that that truly was what just happened, that Nick Hall had fallen. He slipped and fell down 3,000 feet on Mount Rainier. Everyone was at a loss at that moment in time. It was quiet. Luckily, this ranger spoke up and he said the plan now is that those who can go down, go down, Bulger said. Although shocked, everyone remained steadfast in their commitment to the mission and was resolute not to abandon the other individuals on the mountain. They regrouped and pressed on with their mission. There were still three injured people in the party on the mountain with two rangers, as the rest walked down the slope with assistance from the park service. Considering the extended duration of the entire operation, Bulger began to take note of the approaching sunset. He recognized the time constraints and the tight schedule ahead but believed they could still accomplish the task. Ramos had serious doubts about their chances of making it through the storm, given the pure whiteout conditions. However, as they descended, the wind started to calm in time for the sunset, their final light source of the evening and their last opportunity. Ramos and the team then heard the sound of the Chinook again, signaling that it was making one final attempt during this brief window of calm weather to rescue the remaining injured party. The next two climbers went the way that I wish the entire mission did. Just a couple minutes for each climber and no issues whatsoever. It even seemed like the wind died down there for us for just a few minutes. It was perfect, David recalled. Ross Van Dyke, who is in excruciating pain from his injuries, is finally loaded onto the sled. Due to being the least injured, Stacy was slated to be the last person airlifted by the helicopter. The situation was compounded by the onset of a significant storm with powerful winds streaming down from the ridge above, posing a formidable challenge for the helicopter throughout the operation. In attempting to hover over an area with minimal contrast where the view consisted of vast expanses of white ice and snow, David found himself in a challenging situation. High winds only intensified the difficulty, making it akin to trying to balance on the tip of a pen. The pilots had to rotate the task of hovering because it was a physically demanding undertaking. David could attest that, throughout his career leading up to that day and beyond, he had never encountered hovering conditions as arduous as those experienced during that mission on Mount Rainier. They put me on a shelf. Think of it like bunk beds, but they're with litters. And I just remember thinking to myself like, don't hit the mountain, don't hit the mountain, don't hit the mountain, Van Dyke recalls. The cliff face was 20 feet away from the Chinook's rotor system on the right-hand side, and the pilot in the left seat was hovering the helicopter. As the sun dipped below the ridgeline in front of them, the lighting conditions shifted dramatically. David and his team proceeded to lower the penetrator, essentially a seat for rescue purposes. Upon its contact with the ground, the rescue climber swiftly secured the individual in need. David's pilot then faced a critical situation as he yelled, I have lost all outside visual references. I need you to take the controls. This request was prompted by the fact that, with the sun's descent, the surrounding snow transformed into a uniform shade of gray, rendering the terrain indistinguishable. In response, David assumed control of the helicopter, using a single footprint in the snow, visible through his window, as his sole visual reference point. He meticulously maintained a hover holding this position for about 20 seconds, allowing sufficient time for the rescue climber to secure Stacy into the seat. But moments later, the footprint disappeared. The aircraft started moving erratically. The rescue climber on the ground with Stacy Lidl saw the Chinook's erratic movements. He tackles Stacy to the ground and unclips her from the seat. My flight engineer says climbers clear the cable. Let's get out of here. There's nothing else we can do, Bulger recalls. And then the helicopter just took off. It was me and a couple of climbing rangers, and I just remember them being like, cool, so we're here for the night, Lidl said. David and his team experienced a deep sense of concern because they knew the individual they were evacuating was uninjured. However, her harrowing experience on the mountain had left her needing safety and care, prompting their determination to bring her home. Despite their feelings of unease, they recognized that there were no other viable options under the circumstances. Upon landing, David approached the pilot he had been flying with. Drawing from his 10 years of flying experience, he remarked, Hey, in my 10 years, this was the most scared I've ever been. The pilot, with 30 years of flying experience, responded, 
I've been flying for 30 years and that was the most scared I've ever been. Lidl found herself enduring extreme cold, having been exposed to the elements since 2 a.m. that morning, and now it was 10 p.m. She experienced the most frigid conditions she had ever faced and had gone through a traumatic near-death experience earlier in the day. Throughout the night, she was under the watchful eyes of the two climbing rangers, sharing their collective hope and expectation that the helicopter would return the following morning to rescue them, fostering a sense of eager anticipation. So we wake up the next morning and open the tent door, and it's a complete whiteout. Can't even tell which way is down, and one of them just hands me an ice axe and is like, cool, it's go time. At that point, I realize like, okay, you thought the challenge was over, but it keeps going. You have to continue to rise to this occasion. I didn't know if I was capable of what I had to do, Stacy recalled. On his day off, David spoke with two of the pilots who decided to venture back to the mountain the following day. They ascended as far as they could, reaching a point above the cloud layers encompassing Mount Rainier. Their objective was to locate a gap in the clouds that would enable them to descend, but their efforts proved fruitless. Over the subsequent 10 to 12 days, the mountain remained entirely enveloped in dense cloud cover. Stacy and the rangers commenced their descent down the treacherously steep terrain, their visibility severely hindered. As she moved along, the images from the previous day's ordeal continuously replayed in her mind an unrelenting and haunting presence. At one point in the descent, they encountered a significant crevasse that proved insurmountable due to the limited visibility. Frustration set in as they attempted to find a path around it. Stacy's physical, emotional, and mental reserves were depleted, pushing her to the brink of despair. She contemplated the possibility of being unable to take another step. In a moment of profound vulnerability, she made a desperate plea to one ranger, asking him to dig a hole and leave her there as she felt she had reached her limit. It was perhaps the darkest moment she had ever faced or hoped to experience. In response, the ranger offered words of encouragement and challenged her to dig deep, emphasizing that this was the moment that truly mattered. Stacy found the strength to stand up and persevere, and over the course of the day, she managed to successfully descend the mountain to a trailhead. Her Mount Rainier nightmare was finally over. To her surprise, news cameras awaited, capturing the incredible ordeal. She was discreetly whisked away to a nearby house, where she was informed that someone wanted to see her. Opening the front door, Stacy was met by her parents, who were overwhelmed with emotion. The reunion was marked by tears and a sense of gratitude. She questioned how she had survived and contemplated how to move forward from the harrowing experience. Earlier that day, Ross Van Dyke was taken to Madigan Army Base, where he learned the extent of his injuries for the first time. He suffered a dislocated hip and a pulmonary embolism. He had a blood clot on his calf, and a piece of that blood clot went through his heart and made it into his lungs. Doctors informed him it may take a year for him to walk again. And I just remember at that moment, I didn't care. I can still see it today, and it makes me emotional every time I talk about it, he said. When an army officer informed him that a rescuer was killed during the rescue, he was extremely saddened by the news. I couldn't believe that what had happened to us caused the death of somebody else, not to mention the fact that it wasn't even our own party. It was an innocent person who was just trying to help us, he said. Despite the injuries of the harrowing ordeal, Stacy, Stuart, Noel, and Ross all made full recoveries. The events on that day on Mount Rainier affected all that were involved. I don't think it fully hit me. I knew in my head, I knew logically what had happened, but I don't think it hit me emotionally for a few days. And I think watching the memorial service and just seeing all of the people that were there and realizing this was a person who led this incredibly rich life. I don't know. He was someone's son. He was someone's brother, Stacy said. I met with Nick's family at his memorial. I learned a lot about him. This guy dedicated his life to helping other people, and as always, my thoughts and prayers go out to Nick's family. They suffered a great loss, and he was a wonderful man, and he'll always be missed, David Bulger said. Ross has made a significant physical recovery, but the enduring challenge lies in carrying the emotional weight of losing a fellow climber. Many friends, and Ross himself, have viewed the events of that day as nothing short of a miracle with the remarkable survival contrasting starkly with the tragic loss of life. This duality is a burden that Ross continues to carry to this day. In an effort to express his deep care and compassion, Ross initially reached out to the Hall family. 
Despite the tragedy that unfolded, he sought to convey his genuine concern. While he hoped for the possibility of a meaningful connection with the family, building such a relationship has proven to be a gradual and complex process. The turning point came when Carter Hall, Nick Hall's dad, extended an invitation, asking Ross if he would be interested in bear hunting. This proposition marked a significant moment in Ross's life, as he considered the unexpected opportunity to engage in this new experience. Carter stated, I could see Ross's pain. When Ross came to visit Maine last September, he came to do a bear hunt. So I said, Ross, it's a little difficult getting you successful at bear hunting and you're only gonna be here two days. Ross replied, I don't care, Carter. I came to visit you. Stacy grappled with an overwhelming sense of shame, unable to release the idea that her silence and the fact that she was the one who fell were at the heart of the calamity that unfolded. Even though there were multiple contributing factors to the accident, she considered her lack of gracefulness as the catalyst for the disastrous chain of events. Dealing with this intense feeling proved to be an immense burden. However, after seeking therapy, Stacy realized that she was not guilty of any wrongdoing. She had not committed any misdeeds, and her slip and imperfection were not something to be ashamed of. Lidl stated, We did not make all of the best decisions that day. We were not perfect people that day. And it led to a lot of really horrible things happening. But that doesn't make us any less worthy of love. It doesn't make me any less strong. And the thing that I constantly tell myself is, you're going to be okay and you will survive this. It was due to the heroism of the Rangers and the Army Chinook helicopter crew and their grit and determination under the dire and tragic conditions that Stacy made it to base camp and the others to the hospital. She and her fellow climbers are still very grateful to the men who put their lives on the line to ensure their safety. The Rangers were absolute heroes, she said. Standing at the base of that towering peak, remember that the journey ahead will be brutal, unforgiving, and filled with obstacles. But also remember that in the crucible of adversity, you'll forge a version of yourself that's stronger, wiser, and unbreakable. The mountain may be harsh, but it's where you discover the true power of your spirit. Climbing a mountain is an endeavor that demands utmost caution and a deep respect for the forces of nature. In the harsh world of alpine adventure, safety is not a luxury, it's a lifeline. The mountain doesn't care about your ego. Understand your physical and mental limits and stay well within them. Overconfidence can lead to catastrophic consequences. Every missed detail could mean the difference between life and death. Plan meticulously from your gear to your route and always have a backup plan. In the mountains, the weather is your merciless master. Check forecasts and be ready to turn back if conditions deteriorate. Ignoring weather can lead to hypothermia, frostbite, or worse. When climbing in a party, being roped together can be your lifeline. The harsh reality is that one slip can lead to disaster, but a rope can save lives. In the mountains, every ounce of energy matters. Wasteful exertion can lead to exhaustion and critical mistakes. Prioritize efficiency and economy of motion. Reliable communication is your lifeline in emergencies. Ensure you have multiple ways to call for help, such as satellite phones or emergency beacons. Fear is your primal instinct's way of protecting you. Listen to it and be ready to make hard decisions when your gut tells you that something is wrong. The mountains have no room for bravado. If things go south, swallow your pride and retreat. Heroics can lead to tragedy. The mountain shows no mercy for those who grow complacent. Stay vigilant, stay prepared, and never underestimate its power. Remember, the mountain is indifferent to your ambitions and your life. Safety is not a guideline, it's a harsh necessity. Those who neglect it may not live to share their tales of adventure. Important information so you can avoid an outdoor disaster. Thank you for watching. Want more outdoor disaster content? Check out these stories I believe you'll enjoy.